I think one of the things which is happening today in artificial intelligence, while everyone is talking about the same, I keep on saying this thing with a very open kind of, let's say, statement that very few have seen the adoption which is happening and which is happening at a very unprecedented, I would say, pace. Uh, I think there is a sea change which has happened in the whole world of analytics in the last 20 years. And uh, fortunately, I've been witness to many of these, I would say, genre changes in terms of how analytics has become a game-changing aspect for the organization. Interestingly, as we speak, uh, the sum total of analytics AI industry today is close to about $126 billion, growing at a CAGR of about 16, 17%, which is the highest amongst all the exponential technologies. India alone has about 90,000 open positions in analytics AI, and for one position, on an average, there are 28 interviews or 28 prospects which gets shortlisted. That's the dichotomy we are living in, but that's the kind of, let's say, thing on the projection or the market scenario side. But there is a big change which is happening in terms of how organizations, humanity, enterprises, and society are consuming analytics big time. One of the biggest aspects is decision making. Now decision making is a very, very complex aspect today. On an average, a human being takes about 60 odd decisions, strategic, tactical, operational. And when we take these decisions on any given day, what does that have to do after this session? Like most of the folks left after this uh, session, so there was some decision making into this. What is that I have to do as part of my career plan? What's my plan in terms of my relationship? So these are some of the strategic operational tactical decisions we are taking on day-to-day -day basis. And as expected, majority of these decisions are happening through guts, gut, intuition, and influence by our spouses, friends, and colleagues. Now think of a scenario today, how it's happening, that majority of the decisions in the time to come will be influenced by algorithms. Algorithms which are personalized, which are absolutely individualistic to you and are doing the magic in terms of how you shop, how you consume product, how you kind of really look at in terms of the overall buying patterns and how you, in fact, really think about in terms of your next set of, I would say, aspects. And if this is a bit far-fetched, this is exactly what I want to bring to the table in terms of my session. I think just a narrative will sound good out here because Many of the skeptics have talked about that AI is expensive, it cannot be pervasive, it's limited to a certain class, and it cannot have a mass adoption. I want to start with the narrative, it's a story which is in the public domain. The gentleman on the back of this slide is Makato, the one who respects and is a young guy. Makato is an engineer, uh, he's uh, from Japan, and. He's having this picture which was shot in his farm. His parents are in agriculture, and agriculture in Japan is considered as a very revered occupation still. His parents are growing cucumbers. Cucumbers in Japan is a very sought after variety of the crop, and every week there is an auction which is happening. By texture, variety, color, the cucumbers are auctioned. And when Makato finished his engineering, he went to his parents. That's where this uh, image was shot. He talked to his parents, and the first thing his mother said, look, our parents, uh, we've been doing I mean, cucumber farming for the last 20 odd years. Our income is not what it should be. It's not really optimal. So Makato went back. He said, I've done something in engineering, heard about artificial intelligence. Let me put something to use as part of my learning. So he went back, he shot about 5,000 images of the farm of the cucumbers in his camera. He went back, he downloaded a Raspberry Pi 3 controller chip, which he kind of purchased from Amazon for $35. He started downloading Google TensorFlow, which is an open source tool, free of cost, and he started labeling and annotating the data. 
the cucumbers in terms of the variety, the, in terms of textures, colors. And he also started extrapolating in terms of the auction what the cucumbers are fetching in the market. First model, 72%, second, almost 80%. Then he realized, look, he has to better, and he started doing experimentation until he reached almost about 85, 86% in terms of the accuracy rate. He started telling his parents what they should be growing. 18 months down the line, his parents' income have gone up by 400%. 400%, and the cost associated with that is just $35. That's the impact artificial intelligence will, un, will have on you, humanity. Trust me, there are far more widespread examples, and some of them I'll be taking in this session as we move along. I think the fact over there, as we just do a bit of pullback, the genesis of this entire thing is around data. We've talked often about data being a kind of, a, let's say, nemesis, spelling kind of, let's say, trouble for the organization. But the fact over there is that organizations are grappling with a huge quantum of data. Just to kind of, let's say, level set, by the time I'll explain this slide in terms of the numbers, it's already obsolete. Because that's the kind of a quantum of data which is getting generated on a day-to-day -day basis. Just to give in a kind of a number, one zeta byte is equivalent to all the video titles on the Netflix aggregated, multiplied by 470 million times. That's the kind of quantum of data we are talking about. And if that's not enough, we are talking about the social data, the digital data which is coming from different aspects, different channels, different mediums. Now think of a scenario how enterprises are grappling in terms of ensuring, one, they aggregate the proprietary data. Second, they also kind of, let's say, ensure that the digital social data is also giving some meaning to their entire insights or what they're building. Now, the fact over there is that over the surveys or the research which has happened, there is a direct correlation in terms of AI reducing decision latency within the organizations. And above all, for the organizations which are adopting AI in a big way, AI analytics in a big way, they're likely to leapfrog the competition by almost 3.6x time. Now, somewhere, I think we realize that when we talk in terms of artificial intelligence analytics, I think there is always that approach which is kind of, let's say, uh, really resonating in the terms of, I would say, the impact that am I making meaning out of the data? I think the challenge over there, what we usually get stuck with data privacy, regulations, compliance, I think there's another side of the story, what the world is picking up, what is the impact I can make, and what are the decision-making attributes I can influence within the organization by using artificial intelligence. And this is exactly what AI is trying to do. Now, if I take you through a quick journey in terms of how analytics has really morphed in the last 20 years in terms of becoming more smart, embedded, pervasive, I think there is a history behind that. 20 years back, what was something as a holy grail decision-making aspect for CXOs was an MIS report. Simple one-pager, metric-driven dashboard in terms of a complete aspect about the daily production, daily turnover, sales, inventory levels. And that was considered as one single source of truth for the CXOs. To a stage where ERP came in to BIDW, where we saw a barrage of business intelligence tools coming in, and then to a complete change of the genre of analytics. And to a stage what we are talking about, every device, every instrument, every machine getting fitted with the sensor where algorithms are ruling in terms of how they influence our decision making. And I think one thing which became paramount as part of this entire exercise was how do you make your organizations more data savvy, digitally enabled, and somewhere this digital aspect came into the picture where essentially, while there could be de different definitions, kind of, let's say, uh, in, in terms of, I would say, perceptions, what we are talking about in digital is, A, fundamentally, we are talking about, in a great deal, reimagining the customer experience. Second, organizations are compelled in the digital era, era to innovate new product and services. Third, they have no choice but to transform and disrupt their businesses. 
And this is exactly what's happening today if you look at how fintech is really revolutionizing the banking segment, or rather disrupting. Now, the value chain of all these businesses are going for a toss, and the new aspect of the value chains have embedded exponential technologies, largely AI fitted, and giving more kind of dynamic business results. While we talk about all these things, but somewhere, as we talked about, about the quantum of data, the aspect about velocity of data, data alone has no meaning. We've all realized that. Somewhere, organizations are talking about insights, intelligence, and recommendations coming out of the data. And that's where algorithms are proving out to be a game-changing aspect. Now, many of you are familiar. In fact, every one of you are familiar about these set of organizations. For some of you, this would be new age organizations, digital savvy organizations. Essentially, all these organizations have IP-enabled, patented algorithms running under the hood, doing the magic, and becoming a secret source for these organizations. I don't have to spend time, but that's exactly what is happening in terms of these organizations having the best of the best top of the line algorithms running the show for them. <clears throat> and somewhere, as we visualize fast forward few years, and this is my assumption, but somewhere I believe that this could also be a plausible scenario that think of a marketplace where there are challenges in terms of the businesses where you could see it's a supply chain or a sales challenge or a marketing challenge. And you have different CXOs, different decision makers, going and logging into a marketplace which have millions of algorithms. Each and every algorithm is IP, IP'd, patented, having a specific resolution for a specific business challenge. You log in, you buy that algorithm, you test it out in terms of a POC or an engagement. If you like it, just go ahead and execute. Now that's a scenario if you're talking in terms of algorithm economy driving the future of businesses that would mean then the next set of enterprises, as we say, the future of work and the future of workplace and the future of humanity will change dramatically. And somewhere, as we usher into this whole era of algorithm economy, it's not far away. And honestly, I'm not here being gender specific. It's absolutely somewhere algorithms could sit in the boardrooms, taking decisions on behalf of the board or along with the board, and ensuring that they have a say in terms of the entire decision-making process of the companies. In fact, there is a hedge fund in Hong Kong which has officially put an algorithm as part of the member in the boardroom. The algorithm has ability and a repository of all the last 25 years' decisions which have happened in the board meetings and actually has a yes or no button against all the future decision which takes in that particular hedge fund as a company. But as we say that there are flip sides as well, and some of the speakers today will speak about that, but I think that's a usual aspect of every technology that there is a flip side which what we call human biases. If the cost of a book in terms of an algorithm judging it wrong goes for a toss, this is what happens. In this case, the cost of the book is coming out to be $18 million. And who's not heard of the fake news which are being generated by algorithms across the news portals? And there are multiple those kind of, let's say, cases as well. But the aspect over there is that every new technology has this aspect of going wrong if it's construed or constructed in a very different manner. But I think what we essentially talk about as part of this session is decision making. Now, as I narrated and alluded to as part of my earlier uh, uh, pitch, that essentially the decision making process today is all about our intuitions, our kind of, let's say, learnings, our past kind of, let's say, behaviors. And somewhere that reflection is coming in our day to day decision making as well. Until what's happening in the next 10 years, chunk of this decision making will be governed by algorithms. Now, for some of you, it's looking far fetched, but in the subsequent slides from here on, I would like to establish what happens when decision making 
gets changed because of AI coming into the picture. And this is where it starts. Essentially, there has been a lot of uh, talk about what's artificial intelligence. Somewhere we are talking about mimicking the human brain. And somewhere we are also saying that essentially it's all about image, voice, text, and video analytics in terms of sophistication. Because the advancements which have happened in terms of how images are getting classified, videos which are getting analyzed, and speeches, how that's kind of, let's say, interpreted, it's phenomenal. The fact today is that the machine performance in all these four categories is far more exceeding the human performance. I'm sure you've heard about the AlphaGo Zero. I mean, those kind of a chess game which has been launched by Google, they can predict 420 million moves ahead of the opponent before the next move. And our grandmaster Vishwanath Anand can do it just 482 moves. So there is a level of sophistication which has come in. Now, the fact over there is that somewhere, how does it lead to the change in the decision-making process? But before we move to that, one aspect as we move along in terms of future of AI, now there has been a lot of talk about what AI will do as part of the adoption in the industry or what's the future beholding for AI. Fact over there is that this is a truth that AI will become ubiquitous. And as it happens for any technology, when mainstream businesses happen, the cost of technology will drop and every problem will be rephrased as an AI problem. Supply chain to marketing to sales to even I would say a personal life's problem or even relationship problem, somewhere there'll be a component or a tinge of AI built over there in terms of resolution or solving that problem. Now, if statements doesn't make a difference, some facts and numbers will do, and this is what I want to substantiate as part of this uh, aspect close to about $26 billion to $40 billion worth of spend has happened in last year on AI in terms of investments. Now we are talking about outside of $126 billion worth of market segment, which is analytics, a new segment of AI getting created, which will be $100 billion by 2025. And if that's not alone, if we include the RPA component with AI, we're talking about a $150 billion new segment getting created in just four to five years from now. Now, all these new technologies, when they come in, somewhere, I think the correlation is not only adoption, but also in terms of how fast they will be monetized. And I think there is a relevancy in terms of how artificial, artificial intelligence that, I think there is a whole lot of velocity which has built in in terms of how it will be monetized. Second, as it correlates that segment building is fine, any analyst firm will do it, but the adoption metrics are also giving a lot of indication about that AI will actually be high in terms of how the Fortune 500 CXOs or the Fortune 200 CXOs will consume AI. 75% of the C-suite exec executives from the Fortune 500 companies will consume, adopt AI. In fact, as I was preparing this slide, I was looking at some of the reports, it's already happening. It's already that number is far more than what I'm showing out here. And even the impact scenarios in terms of AI, whether it's the sales piece in terms of accentuation, the bottom line enhancement, or the customer interactivity in terms of the customer Deloitte or NPS, the usage of AI is throwing far more better results in terms of quantification and business impact. And one thing which is important and pertinent out here, what about the legards? Now, as you see the right side of this slide, $1.2 trillion worth of business will be stolen, actually, from the competitors who are fast, nimble, agile in AI versus the legards. Now, that's a big number what we're talking about in terms of the organizations and enterprises which will be slow in decision making will lose out on this AI race. Now, if I take an enterprise view, these are the numbers, but even for the first time, there is a whole, and I'm sure a lot of you are, are queued in in terms of what's happening in the nations. As we speak today, 28 nations are either crafting, conceptualizing, or they already have a curated AI policy. 28 nations, India is one of them. For the first time, we've seen a technology wave 
which is impacting humanity, enterprises, and nations. And this wave will continue. And as we say that, while we talk about this whole mimicking of the human brain in terms of the ability to process, act, perceive, and learn, I mean, there is a far more widespread aspects of AI which is getting implemented or adopted by the organizations. Now, this is where we, we say when the decision-making aspect comes into the picture, we are talking about a triangulation or a trifactor. For a decision maker, whether on a CXO level or a project level or at a PNL level, there are three dimensions in terms of how decision making through AI is getting impacted. One, we are talking about augmenting the intelligence, which means that today, with the sophistication of the machines, there is an ability to pick data from the non obvious sources. And I'll talk about that, which is what we say how you can actually distill the signal from the noise. Second aspect is about what we say, automate and learn. Because for the first time, you're talking about a scenario for many of, I would say, the skeptics, and there is a rhetoric around automation, jobs will be lost. I think it's all about rebalancing the human-machine equation. Third piece, which is often neglected, but very pertinent when we talk about the AI era decision-making change is incorporating the human behavior. And I want to lace it up with examples as I move along. <clears throat> so this first example in terms of augmenting the intelligence, the gentleman on the left, who's he? Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook. Now, the discussion is not about Cambridge Analytica or Facebook. The discussion is every listed company goes through an earning call. Every three months, the CEO is actually on the podium talking about a great aspect about the company. I have never seen a CEO not being positive in the earning calls ever, which means that there is a huge money at stake for the hedge funds, for the stakeholders, shareholders, who have put in the money in the organization. And if the projections don't match with what the CEOs are saying, they have no option but to believe. So what they're trying to do is to unravel AI into the picture. Every kind of, let's say, voice aspect about any lump in the throat while a CEO speaks, any modulation in the voice could be considered sign of the weakness. Now, fact today is that CIO, CEOs are smart. They are well rehearsed, well tutored. They can always fake it out. Then they go to the extent of doing the video analysis. Any kind of facial expressions not matching with the voice or the numbers could be another sign of weakness. CEOs fake it out. But what happens now in terms of a live feed, live scenario is the CEO is on the stage talking great about the company, is very buoyant about the organization sequentially, quarter-wise, and is maintaining a very positive momentum. But the CFO at the back at the same time is poker-faced, simple expression. Somewhere that correlation could be an indication that there's something wrong about the organization. The second example out here. Now, usually it could be a parking lot in a retail mall and you could gauge the footfalls. That's dated mechanism. So what this US retail company is doing, they've got satellite imagery cameras, feeds in terms of the parking lots available, which is not a new thing. But what they're trying to do is, they're trying to ascertain the make of the cars, the density of the cars, the time the cars are parked in the parking lot all across, and trying to extrapolate those data points with the earnings potential they could have in the next three to six months. Now look at the data sources, which were for a period non-obvious, now coming into the mainstream for enabling decision making for the enterprises. Let's look at this video feed. Base man, base man, base man. Let's go, Rock. let's go. Over here, over here. No, come on, come on, come on. Side. Good in. Good side. Quick throw. It is. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go.
So this is a 20-second video feed of a Super Bowl final match, which happened a couple of years back. And uh, there's a lot of, I would say, money which is riding on this kind of a final match. $160 billion of ad spend happens in one single Super Bowl match. One TV commercial cost about $3.5 to $4 million. Imagine the cost getting involved. Now, if you are a CMO in an organization and your brand was riding on this match and you took special approvals from your CEO to get the budgets for this match, and if your team lost, you could be in a panic mode next day and you will avoid the CEO. But as it happens, you meet the CEO in the gallery and the first thing your CEO say, look, I'm in a bad mood, why don't you meet me in my room? You go in the room and meet and the first thing he says, look, we did not see our brand yesterday. CMO is smart. What he or she did was to carry this 20 second light live feed, not in the style what I showed you, but in the style what's about to come. Face me. Face me. Look at the brands which are getting focused on the right side. Let's go, uh, let's go. Over here, over here. No, come on, come on, come on. I'm sure you can make the difference. And one dashboard could give, a, give enough glimpse to the CEO that he or she was wrong. It's a sheer marketing mix modeling in terms of looking at labeling and annotating of the data on a live match feed and gauging. And you could see that the logo of the brands was visible on the jersey of the players, the turf of the stadium, the aisle galleries of the players. This is exactly what happens in a 20 second. Imagine how the live feed happens in terms of brand visibility in the entire match. And this is where you say how the intelligence gets augmented for the organizations to take the next level of decisions. Now, something which is getting really changed today is healthcare through the usage of AI. And I say with a bit of, I would say, a different aspect that the job of a radiologist oncologist is in danger. CT scans, MRI, x-rays, all are getting analyzed through deep learning algorithms, machine learning features in split second and millions of that. The fact today is that radiologist, be in India or outside, is considered a very glamorous medical occupation. A radiologist spends about 15 minutes on an average to analyze a CT scan, x-ray, or an MRI, and the error rate is quite high still. In a chest, close to about 15 symptoms or elements can go wrong. And a machine learning, deep learning algorithm fed, millions of survey can do the same thing with a 99.7% accuracy in few milliseconds. Now the first aspect of the question you will have in your mind, what's the job of a radiologist? I just want you to park your thoughts, I'll come to why I'm saying to hold your thoughts on this. And the other example is something which is close to my heart and something what I say how AI for humanity exists today. And it's a life, uh, or rather a real case study ab available in the public domain. The gentleman on the right side, uh, what you see wearing specs, uh, glasses, is Saqib Sheikh. Saqib Sheikh is born and bred up in Pakistan. He moved to US 14 years back. Saqib is visually impaired. He can't see. He got a job in Microsoft when he landed in uh, US after six months. And after a few months of working with Microsoft, uh, the folks in Microsoft, his friends and colleagues said, look, Saqib, why don't we make your life magical? Saqib said, look, I can't see. There's nothing called magical in my life. They said, wait. After six months, they gave him a pair of glasses. Now, these are not the ordinary pair of glasses. When Saqib moves out to meet his friends, steps out, 
out, uh, out of his home to meet his friends, goes to his office, he wears these pair of glasses. The glasses have an innate ability to click pictures on the go. As he puts his finger on the left side of the stem, what you could see out here, he can start clicking the pictures. Now you would say, look, pictures have no meaning for the person who can't see, who's visually impaired. But the pictures on a real-time basis are getting translated into voice. He wears those Bluetooth earphones, and what he could hear now is, Sakip, 15 meters ahead of you, there could be a 15-year, probably, kid on a skateboard wearing a kind of a beige trouser, navy blue jersey with black shoes. Would you like to meet him? Imagine the magic happening for Sakib. Image, voice, text, and video analytics coming to the picture. And as we say, the next thing which is important as part of the whole automation today is how do we balance human and machine equation? It's a big thing today. Let me give some examples. 7,000 deaths happen in the US because of wrong prescription of drugs and medicine. With all due regards, doctor writings, doctor handwriting is universal. Most of the times, you can't make out. And what it happens in terms of a pharmacist across the counter giving wrong medicines, ending up in some fatalities. And this pharmacy chain said, enough is enough. $14 billion of lawsuits got filed, and the pharmacy chain said, look, we got to find some solution. So what they did, they deployed a human robotic arm at one of the stores in Union Square in San Francisco. And this humanoid, or rather human robotic arm, actually is nothing. When I say nothing, the purpose is, as you walk across the store, you have a prescription, you give the prescription to this robotic arm, you don't meet the pharmacist. The robotic arm takes the prescription, scans on the go, correlates with all the previous symptoms and ailments of the same prescription of what you had in the last 10 years, because patient data records are linked in US, goes across the aisle of the store, picks up the medicine, and delivers to you, and you can pay by a contactless credit card in flat 55 seconds. 99.7% accuracy rate. Now, in the earlier case, it was radiologist. In this instance, we are talking about pharmacist losing the job. Well, not. That's not true. A radiologist and pharmacist are not supposed to analyze the CT scans or MRIs or X-rays. And a pharmacist's job is not to prescribe the medicine. Their core job is to counsel the well-being of the patients. This is exactly what happens in every revolution. The top of the pyramid jobs always get kind of distorted because the transactional meaning and aspect of those jobs gets automated. And this is exactly what is happening in the automation AI era, where we are talking about jobs getting lost, but the skills getting augmented. One of the recent uh, McKinsey surveys said that, that 1.8 million jobs globally will be lost by 2022, and 2.2 million jobs will be created at the same time, which means a net addition of almost half a billion, or rather half a yeah, billion jobs. But all these half a billion jobs will be in the new age side of the things, which means that there's a tremendous shift in terms of the talent landscape which is happening globally. And somewhere, when we say how automation also reflects in terms of what happens, that a case of a metro or a moving tube in London, anything can go wrong. And the biggest casualty could be if the doors malfunction. A simple case of predictive asset maintainer where the manufacturers and the OEM suppliers can get to know what can go wrong in terms of preemptive basis so that can replace any part of the door which can get malfunctioned. There's one more feed out here, which for many of us would be a feed which is of a kind of a surveillance camera, which is trying to gauge any kind of a security infringement or a theft or a mugging case. Well, this feed is of a e-commerce giant in China, 24 by 7 uh, warehouse, uh, 22, uh, close to about 2,200 workers operate at any given point of time, and millions of transactions 
happens on a daily basis. Now, what this video feed is getting analyzed is not for security infringement or theft. The HR managers, supervisors are sitting to analyze at what point of time the fatigue goes high so that they can shut the transactions and the delivery for that period and announce pat on the back awards or the spot awards. Today, many of us know that the pat on the back and spot awards are periodic. Good time is Friday, 4 o'clock, just give it to so that people can leave happy. For the first time, the decision-making aspect is through the facial expression, recognizing that the employees are getting fatigued, let's give them the awards at that point of time. So how the decision-making aspect in those aspects will be changed, this is one reflection. And somewhere we say that, look, automation to an extent is fine, but as Tesla also noticed, and Mr. Elon Musk had to admit that maybe too much of automation is detrimental somewhere. And we've all seen those tweets and somewhere, I think many of these organization CXOs operate by tweets only, so what they say is what we can infer. And I think that's where one of the reflection is how automation can be detrimental in terms of an organizational ability to make those faster decision making as well. The last aspect out here, which is often neglected, I keep on saying, but very pertinent is human behavior. Now, the fact over there is that, that as human beings, you can have the best of the algorithms, you have the best of the data engineering, the best of the techniques, but what if the adoption and the design does not give you a large set of population to experiment or to kind of use that product or services? And that's where the nudge theory comes into the picture. This is a live kind of a, let's say, visual dashboard of an oral brief toothbrush. The toothbrush comes fitted with a sensor, not a big deal. Now, what you can do alongside is you can actually download the app on your mobile. And the fact today is that the idle brushing time in terms of oral hygiene is close to about two minutes. Specifically, kids don't brush for two minutes. So what this app does is as the kid starts brushing in the morning at the time of school going, you can actually start analyzing the app in terms of the features. So anything less than two minutes, the emoji on the app turns red, there is a frowning noise, and the kid is not happy because we know that not only kids, our life today is getting governed by emojis and emoticons. And somewhere then the kid says, okay, let me brush again. He or she does it, more than two minutes, now the emoji is happy, there is a jingle, the kid goes to school. Now that's a different thing, this app is being used more by adults. Two minutes is a long period. Now, this ice cream chain, or rather ice cream manufacturer, tried multiple things to increase the sales with this retail giant. They placed products of their ice creams in multiple aisles, changed the kind of location, did a lot of loyalty, uh, discount coupon kind of mechanism, nothing worked until they did this trick. <laughs> I'm sure each one of you can associate the jingle in our early childhood days. The shoppers got really enticed in terms of looking where this jingle is playing. They walked to that part of the store. The ice cream sales went up by 30% in one quarter. Just a small nudge. And the last example I want to give before I move to the video feed is, God forbid, if someone has to go through this experience, it's absolutely claustrophobic, absolutely agonizing. Sedation rates among the kids is 80%. The whole setup looks so kind of, let's say, harrowing for each one of us. We always dread that we should not go. Until one of the manufacturers think of, think of this kind of a design. I'm sure now even we would like to also see if we can actually use this. 10% sedation rate. That's the kind of level set in terms of nudge, design change, what we are talking about. And I'll play this clip.
the solution to be implemented in Bangalore? I'm sure many of you can relate to this, and this is exactly what we say that when data algorithms don't work, some way the Nash theory works. And when I finally wrap it up, I just want to build one aspect about this entire AI talk about or hoopla or hype is first, what's the new normal today in strategy and business transformation? That's AI is not enough. And I'm sure by these examples, use cases, you could see that. Second, what we need is outside of algorithm, a very high powered data engineering techniques, good data pipes, good data lakes, and not to be taken out the whole aspect of design from a design thinking behavioral aspect. And somewhere this correlation comes into the last what I want to show you that, look at this video feed. The Brussels Motor Show, the biggest car event in Belgium, where all car brands show off their newest technologies. But it was Volvo who hijacked all the attention with the first car that could recruit its own technicians. Volvo presents the recruiting car. Ik ben de HR90. Ik ben op zoek naar onderhoudstechnici voor de Volvo fabriek in Gent. 200 job openings were announced on social media, inviting everyone to come and check out the first car that recruits its own engineers. To conduct the interviews, we tapped into the car's technology. Welcome, Oliver. Glad to see you put on your blue shirt for the interview. Can you show me where my electric compressor is? Sure. Here. Please allow me to play some piano music to make you feel more comfortable. Tell me, why should I hire you? Um, I've been passionate about cool. By applying AI, we could actually test social and technical skills and make unbiased evaluations of all applicants. These were sent to Volvo's HR managers for further interviews. Changing the conversation from cars to jobs got us national media attention. Et l'entretien d'embauche sera d'abord mené par un véhicule et par son intelligence artificielle. 70% of all news coverage about the Brussels Motor Show was dedicated to Volvo. More than one in two Belgians was reached through PR coverage alone, leading to 300% more price requests. And the 200 vacancies, well, they were all filled. 